So our next speaker is Angeline Rice, who's a doctoral student at Oxford and is working on uh, the topic of her talk, which is Sir Thomas Phillips' Purchases of Manuscripts in Switzerland, an Analysis of Sources. Thank you. So, owner of a collection comprising about 60,000 manuscripts and 50,000 printed books, Sir Thomas Phillips was, and I quote, one of the greatest collector of manuscript matter the world has ever known, according to the book historian and bibliographer Simo de Ricci. Even though he particularly appreciated manuscripts written on vellum, he could not help buying all sorts of books, archival documents, photographs, archaeological artifacts. Besides his collecting activities, Phillips was also fascinated by historical and paleographical studies and published on his own press many catalogues, genealogical research, as well as edition of manuscripts. At his father's death in 1818, Phillips inherited Middle Hill Estate in Worcestershire and a comfortable annual income. But as his passion for manuscripts rapidly increased, he soon faced financial issues, being unable to pay his creditors and booksellers on time. In 1822, he decided to leave England to reduce his debts and settle in Bern with his wife, for he thought that cost of living was more affordable there and book buying temptations less strong. This was, however, a miscalculation. And Phillips <laughs> bought 233 manuscripts and more than 500 printed books during his one year stay in Switzerland. While he purchased the great majority of these items from professional dealers working at Bern, Lausanne, Zurich, and Bâle. He also managed to obtain rare books from private and religious owners, especially on his visits to Fribourg. Madame de Praromont, for example, sold him two manuscript chronicles. One of them contains a 15th century account of the history of Fribourg, and the other deals with the history of the city on Bern, of Bern and was copied by Peter Falk, humanist and Swiss ambassador to Italy and France. And Falk also painted his coat of arms on the original binding here. Uh, Phillips also went to the College of the Jesuits and, and purchased about 60 items, of which 24 incunabula, including this unique copy of Philippus de Montecalieros Dominicale, printed in Paris in about 1500 from the Cistercian nuns of La Megrouge, an abbey close to the city of Fribourg, he acquired this 14th century graduale written on parchment. Once he got back to Middle Hill, Phillips catalogued his new books and integrated them in his library known as the Biblioteca Philippica. After his death, the Swiss manuscripts were mainly auctioned before the First World War and are now in various libraries around the world. In 1923, the American book dealer, Dr. Hosenbach, bought most of the Swiss incunabula, along with 700 other 15th century printed books, and sold them to Henry Edwards Huntington. The dispersal of the other printed books is slightly more difficult to follow throughout the numerous sales of the Phillips collection, and still needs to be thoroughly investigated. My doctoral research concentrates on Phillips's purchases in Switzerland in 1822 and 1823, and on their dispersal in the early 20th century. By means of a combined methodology based on the analysis of books material, the reading of archival documents, and the use of historical bibliographical resources, 
I seek to understand the changing value assigned to books by members of the antiquarian book trade and how these items have been gradually defined as rare and as part of a country cultural heritage. My talk will concentrate on a German manuscript owned by the Hermits of St. Augustine of Fribourg and of which acquisition and use by Philips is extremely and unusually well documented. This story has already been detailed by Romain Giraud in his introduction to the Catalogue des Manuscrits Medievaux de la Bibliothèque Cantonale Universitaire de Fribourg. <laughs> Today, I'll show how primary sources, that is, the manuscript itself, or the books formerly owned by the Augustinians, Philips's notebook, correspondence and publishing material, as well as library and auction catalogues, provide valuable insights to understand why some Swiss owners dispersed their rare books, how an Englishman built his library abroad, and what were his reasons for selecting particular manuscripts. So here's the manuscript which contains the text of Ludolfus of Suchan, uh, Heise in Das Heiliges Land. Little is known about the author, whose correct name, Ludolf, was wrongly translated into Peter in High German manuscripts, as well as in ours, like here. Written in about 1350, the text is the account of Ludolf's pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and is dedicated to Baldwin of Steinfurt, Bishop of Paderborn. This story, first written in Latin, was very successful, and by 1400, handwritten translations into Low and High German were produced. The text also appeared in three Latin and three German incunabula editions. Let's now look at the Augustinian's monastery, uh, manuscript, which is a late 15th century German translation of Ludolf's text. Its exact date and place of production remain unknown, partly because its color font is incomplete. Furthermore, the stamps used to decorate the covers have not been precisely identified and thus do not help clarify the book early provenance history. In the late 1560s, a German-speaking scribe wrote an inscription which contains the name of two men a certain Jacobe Kufeins and a Janelli Schmitz. This person probably also listed other individuals' names on an upper end leaf. While some of these surnames, such as Schmidt, are attested in Fribourg by the 16th century, the only reliable evidence confirming the presence of this manuscript in the Augustinian's monastery consists of this inscription dated to 1654. Other incunabula and manuscripts formerly in their possession, identified in libraries in Fribourg, Strasbourg, and London, bear similar inscriptions with the same date. It is quite possible, therefore, that 1654 matches a catalog entry rather than a catalog entry date rather than a date of acquisition. Philips visited the Augustinian's monastery on the 2nd of July, 1823, and took time to consult various books, which he listed in a notebook. After his description of Ludolf's text, Philips proudly commented, and I quote, Nota bene, this book was lent to me by the prior of the convent, and I intend to print it and to send it back to him with a printed copy. The monks also kept record of the loan, but added a slightly different statement to the library catalogue. They explained that prior Gelas Reinhardt had already given, uh, had already lent the manuscript to the provost of Fribourg Collegiate Church, Toby Nicola de Fiva, who subsequently gave it to an Anglois. This divergence might be explained by the different time when these notes were written. And while we can reasonably assume that Philips described the books he consulted on the day of his visit or soon after, it's possible that the Augustinians annotated their catalogues months or years later and did not remember very well what had happened. 
Once he returned to England, Phillips quickly started to work on a printed edition of the manuscript. He first needed to prepare a handwritten version of the text, which he could then give to a printer. A short portion of this work survives in the Grolly Club of New York. Phillips created a title page in Latin, which contains information about Rudolf's text and the edited sources. The manuscript also presents the publisher's name and sketches of his logo, the Middle Hill Tower, in which Phillips's printing press was located. The transcription then contains the table of contents, the introduction, and the beginning of the first three chapters. While these pages were undoubtedly written by Phillips, he probably did not transcribe the text himself because his knowledge of German was limited. According to his biographer, A.N.L.N. Mumby, we know that he employed various scholars, as well as his wife and daughters, to copy the medieval manuscript he wished to publish, but it is difficult to know which one of them could read German. Once the transcription of the manuscript was complete, Adolphus Brightly, who worked for Phillips from 1822 to 1825, printed the proof sheets which Phillips edited. The whole process of transcription, printing of the proofs, and edition of the text only took a few months, and on the 12th of January 1824, uh, Phillips sent to his Bernese friend, Jakob Samuel Wittenbach, the beginning of his work, of his work, Phillips enthusiastically explained that he had succeeded in printing an unedited manuscript, which he had discovered in the Augustinian's monastery. Uh, <clears throat> acknowledging, he, uh, he also asked his friend to circulate the news in Fribourg. Acknowledging the gift, Wittenberg replied that the, audition, the edition was interesting but as he had no acquaintance in Fribourg, could not inform the Augustinians of the progress of his friend. Meanwhile, Phillips continued his work, and by September 1825, he had produced a third of the publication, but then the printing suddenly stopped in the chapter entitled Von der Insel Rodis. In 1839, Phillips resumed his work and revise the table of contents as shown by this proof sheet. He, however, never finished to print the whole edition of the manuscript. And although he did not send the book back to the Augustinians, perhaps because he was hoping to resume his work, he did not consider himself as its owner. And it is only after his death in 1872 yeah. that the book was integrated into his collection and as MS Phillips 24505, and it later received the shelf mark A68.655. In April 11, uh, 1911, Sotheby's auctioned the manuscript. Member of the members of the Mokata Library Committee purchased it for 17 pounds and 10 cents, a rather high price compared to other lots, and presented it to UCL Library. The book strengthened the college's collection of German manuscripts, which was increasingly expanding after the nomination as Professor of German Studies of the eminent paleographer Robert Priebsch. This book was exactly the kind of material that supported his work. And let's now analyze what the story tells us about the Augustinians' attitude toward their books and about Phillips's reasons for choosing this manuscript. Let's also identify the various notions associated with this item. If we look at the Augustinians' reaction, it is important to point out that they did not sell the manuscript, but only agreed to lend it to Phillips, probably because he had convinced them that the text was worth publishing. As the comment they added to the library catalog demonstrates, they considered themselves the book's true owner and were expecting to retrieve it. They therefore offer a contrasting approach to, other books, uh, to, to their books compared to that of other religious congregations in Fribourg, such as the Jesuits or the Cistercian nuns. 
Their, attitu their attitude, however, radically changed at the time of the Zunderburg War in 1847-1848, which opposed Catholic to Protestant canton. Anticipating the victory of the radical and anti-clerical supporters, which would lead to the suppression of their monastery, the Augustinians took advantage of the situation and probably sold some of their books, as has been suggested by Willem Meyer, author of the 1917 Catalogue des Incunables de la Bibliothèque Cantonale Universitaire de Fribourg, and also by Juron. The fact that none of the manuscripts recorded by Philips appeared in the, in the 1855 catalogue of Fribourg Library, which contains the collections transferred for the former religious institutions, supports, the, supports this hypothesis. This might also suggest that Philips could only look at manuscripts which did not constitute the core of the Augustinian's library. Uh, furthermore, the presence of two manuscripts described by Phillips in private libraries in the late 19th century offers additional supporting evidence of the sale. The sixth item consulted by Phillips was probably put on sale in the French-speaking area, as shown by this inscription in French, before being part of the collection of Alexander James Beresford Hope, and later of that of George Matthews Arnold. The British Library bought it from the auctioneers Putik and Simpson in December 1912. Another manuscript that Phillips listed as Johannes Damascheni Canone Semedicine, which is a miscellany of medical treaties, belonged in the 19th century to a physician named Mayor before entering the Geneva Library. In addition to these items, Further manuscripts and printed books formerly owned by the Augustinians can be found today in the British Library, the Duchess Anna Amalia Library at Weimar, Strasbourg National and University Library, Brown University Library, and Penn, Univers and Penn Libraries at Philadelphia. Turning now to Phillips, we notice that even though it took time to consult various books in the Augustinians' library, he primarily focused on Ludolf's account because of its contents. He immediately recognized the manuscript's historical value and thought that it had never been published. He was wrong at this point for, as I mentioned earlier, six Latin and German editions of the text had been printed in the 15th century. The manus this manuscript is a good example of the kind of books Philips bought during his one year stay in Switzerland. While he did not resist purchasing manuscripts written on, on parchment and rare printed books, he also acquired many historical sources which he could preserve, which he wanted to preserve and to edit. The material relating to his publishing activities shows well that despite his poor paleographical and organizational skills, Phillips enthusiastically tried to print a serious piece of work. Like the numerous catalories, antiquarian and genealogical documents that he bought and edited, the acquisition of this book matches to some extent Phillips' collecting activities on a larger scale. Finally, the price fetched by the manuscript at Sotheby's clearly indicates that it had become a sellable book because of its contents, language, script, and probably also because it had belonged to one of the greatest English book collectors of the 19th century. To conclude, although this case study concentrates on Phillips's acquisition of one manuscript, I hope it has demonstrated that over the centuries, a book can be valued as a historical account, a financial product, a scholarly resource, or as an expensive and collectible artifact. Identifying and understanding these notions <coughs> enables us to think of how we consider our, heritage, our cultural heritage. Thank you.